Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and in today's video we are looking at what happens if we do not ignore air resistance. Often in physics problems, in order to make things simpler and easier to work with, we're told to ignore air resistance. But unfortunately, real life is not often simple and easy to work with. As always, you don't need to know any advanced mathematics in order to follow along with this video, and if you enjoy it, please do hit the thumbs up, the subscribe, and the bell buttons. Check out my Patreon page too if you'd like to support me on there. Let's get into it. Now, the setup that we'll be studying today is that of an oscillating pendulum. We'll be looking at how normally we like to ignore air resistance, and we'll be looking at how the mathematics and the physics changes when we add the air resistance in. But first, I'd like to discuss a slightly different concept that many of us may be familiar with already. Terminal velocity. When an object falls towards the ground, we often model it as having two forces acting on it. The downward constant gravitational force and the upward constantly changing air resistance or drag force. The important thing here is how we model that drag force. We're going to keep it relatively simple and say that when an object moves faster through the air, the drag force on it is correspondingly larger, whereas a slow moving object will have a correspondingly smaller drag force acting on it. This makes sense if you think about sticking your head out of a slow moving car window versus that of a fast moving car. When the car is moving quickly through the air, we feel a much greater drag force acting on us because the air molecules are exerting a larger force on our face. Now, let's come back to thinking about our falling object. Just as soon as we let it go, just as soon as it begins to fall, the only force acting on it is the gravitational force, because at this point in time, it doesn't have any speed through the air, and therefore there's no drag force. This downward gravitational force causes our object to accelerate downward, and as it gains speed, falling downward, the drag force in the upward direction increases in size. Eventually we get to a point where the object is falling quickly enough through the air, that the upward drag force is exactly equal to the downward gravitational force. At this point, the two forces exactly cancel each other out because they're acting in opposite directions and have the same size, and therefore the net force on our object is zero. We can recall from Newton's first law of motion that when an object has a net force of zero acting on it, it continues to move at the same speed, technically the same velocity, it was moving with before. This is the velocity known as terminal velocity. Now, many of us will be already familiar with this kind of reasoning. If not, I'll leave some resources in the description box below. The important takeaway from this, though, is that we will be modeling air resistance in exactly the same way. An object moving through the air more quickly will be experiencing a larger drag force. When we consider our pendulum, the faster the pendulum moves through the air, the larger the drag force on it. Specifically, we're going to say that the drag force on our pendulum, we can call this F subscript D, is directly proportional to the speed of the pendulum. Okay, let's pause and rewind a little bit here. The first important thing to note is that we often talk about an oscillating pendulum in terms of the angle theta that it makes to the vertical. In other words, the angle that the pendulum creates between when it's stationary down the middle, not moving, and its current position. We could decide to talk about it in terms of, say, the x and y coordinates of the bob of the pendulum. But this is a little bit trickier because the path along which the pendulum bob moves is a curved path. So instead, it's just easier to think about theta and how theta changes over time. Well, if we're going to be using theta, then we also need to understand a couple of things about how we measure the speed of the pendulum. Now, if we consider another object, let's say moving in a straight line, we know that its speed is equal to the distance it travels divided by the time taken for that distance to be traveled. In the same way, we can define a quantity known as the angular speed of our pendulum, the amount of angle covered per unit time. In other words, if our pendulum moves, say, 5 degrees in a second, the angular speed is 5 degrees per second. And for those of you that are familiar with calculus, you'll know that this is how we write that, d theta by dt. In the same way that linear speed can be written dx by dt, where x is the displacement. And if you don't know calculus, then maybe you'll have seen an equation that looks like this. v is equal to delta x divided by delta t. The change in distance, or horizontal displacement, divided by the change in time from beginning to end. Well, dx by dt is just a slightly more advanced version of that. And similarly, we've got an angular speed, d theta by dt. Technically, we're looking at an angular velocity because the direction in which the pendulum is moving is accounted for, but for this video, I'm just going to call it speed. Now, in exactly the same way, we can define an angular acceleration. Coming back to our linear example that helped us earlier, linear acceleration is the rate of change of speed, technically velocity, and in the same way, angular acceleration is how much the angular speed or velocity changes per unit time. 
And just as a notation thing, we write this as d2 theta by dt squared, the same way we write linear acceleration as d2x by dt squared. Basically, all we need to know is that we're looking at three things, the angular displacement or angular distance, whatever you want to call it, theta. And we're looking at the rate of change of this quantity, which is d theta by dt. And we're looking at the rate of change of that quantity, which is d2 theta by dt squared. The reason we're looking at these quantities at all is because we can use them to create an equation that describes how our pendulum moves, first without any air resistance and then with air resistance. But before we do, we need to look at another bit of physics very quickly. Newton's second law of motion tells us that the net force on an object, F, is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by its acceleration, which for an object moving in a straight line, we can simply write as M multiplied by d2x by dt squared. Well, we're going to jank this notation slightly, and if you're a physicist or a mathematician, I'm about to do something horrendous, so please look away now. Okay, so what we're going to do is to use the angular acceleration rather than the linear acceleration. The left-hand side is no longer the net force, it's a related quantity, but we don't have the time to go through the whole derivation, and the mathematics is correct, so instead I'll leave some resources in the description, and I'm going to make a separate video about this. If we consider the pendulum, there's a gravitational force acting on the bob because we're assuming that all the mass is located there, and that force acts in a downward direction. Now the component of that force acting in this direction simply acts to balance out the tension in the rod or the string, whatever is holding up the pendulum bob. But the component of that force in the perpendicular direction, that is the theta direction, is the force that's giving us the net force on our pendulum. It's the force that causes our pendulum to move in the first place. And the way that this component is found is by multiplying the downward acting force by a factor of sine theta. Again, if you're not sure about how we get this, then there are some wonderful resources about how to find the components of forces in different directions. But basically we can then create an equation that tells us the net force on the equation or a quantity related to it is equal to the component of that force in the theta direction, since that's the only unbalanced force that's acting on our pendulum. This is what's going to cause our pendulum to move. Now, what we've got here is an equation of motion for our pendulum. We can try and solve it, which basically means we want to find theta as a function of the time t. In other words, we want to find how theta changes over time, assuming the net force on our pendulum is simply the theta component of the gravitational force. This equation, unfortunately, is a little bit difficult to solve, but we can make our life a little bit easier if we only consider the pendulum swinging to up to around 60 degrees. The reason we can do this is because for up to about 60 degrees, the sine theta part of our equation can simply be replaced with theta. This looks really weird, right? It's known as the small angle approximation. And I'm gonna make a separate video about that as well, but just as a quick description, for very small values of theta, sine theta looks a little bit like theta. We can see that for around 60 degrees, there's a reasonable match between the two, but for above 60 degrees, this just definitely isn't the case. Now. This equation, again, assuming we're only looking at a small range of oscillation for our pendulum, is much easier to solve. Doing so requires a knowledge of differential equations, and when we solve it, this is the solution that we get. Theta varies over time as a sinusoid. In other words, the pendulum oscillates like this. So we found for this particular pendulum, when there's no air resistance, this pendulum will continue to oscillate back and forth, back and forth with exactly the same amplitude forever. But hold on, what's this? Air resistance has entered the chat. How are we going to account for this mathematically? Well, we do exactly what we did earlier. We assume that the drag force is directly proportional to the speed of the pendulum. Essentially, we're just going to add another term into our equation of motion that now accounts for the drag force acting on our pendulum. And we're going to say that this drag force is equal to gamma, the proportionality constant, multiplied by the angular speed of the pendulum. But there's a couple of things to think about here. Firstly, the drag force is acting in the opposite direction to the gravitational force, or at least the component of gravitational force in the theta direction, and that is signified by the negative sign. This makes sense because if the gravitational force is pulling our pendulum this way, then the drag force is going to be opposing that, acting in that direction. Secondly, gamma, which we've said is the constant of proportionality, is actually a measure of the strength of the drag force created by the particular medium that we're considering. In this case, that's air. However, if we were to replace all of the air around our pendulum with honey, then the pendulum could move at exactly the same speed as the one in air, but it would experience a much larger drag force. Gamma for honey is much bigger than gamma for air. So this is how we quantify something about the air. The value of gamma depends on what medium the pendulum is moving through.
Now, moving forward, we're just going to call it Gamma rather than Gamma Subscript Air because we're only going to be considering the air pendulum anyway. But you know what's going on. And so we now have a different equation of motion, this time accounting for not only the gravitational force, but also the drag force due to the air particles. And we can try and solve this equation as well, slightly more involved than the previous one, and we find that the solution looks like this. A lot of maths, a lot of complexity, but there's a couple of things I want us to look at specifically. Firstly, the sinusoidal motion is back. There is some sort of oscillation going on back and forth. But secondly, we also notice an exponential term in our solution. The negative sign in the exponential means that it's a decaying exponential, as opposed to a positive sign making the exponential look like this. And so when we multiply a decaying exponential by a sine curve, the end result looks something like this. In other words, our pendulum does oscillate. But the amplitude of this oscillation gets smaller and smaller as time progresses. And of course, you'll notice that the rate at which this oscillation sort of falls off is exponential. This is the exponential envelope multiplying our sinusoidal oscillation part of the solution. Our oscillation, in other words, is decaying purely due to the air resistance. And this makes sense. We've initially got a pendulum that's oscillating and the drag force is acting on it constantly as it moves back and forth. But this drag force is taking energy out of the system. We're transferring energy to the air particles. And so the oscillation dies away. And so just by including a very simple model of air resistance in our mathematics, we found a solution that looks much more like a real pendulum, at least on Earth. And with all of that being said, I'd like to thank you so much for watching this video. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Hit the bell button if you'd like to be notified whenever I upload. And please do check out my Patreon as well if you'd like to support me on there. Let me know what other topics you'd like me to cover in a future video. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you real soon.